Welcome everyone to our Zojo Talk podcast. Today, my special guest is Kem Tekenai, and I, yes, have pronounced that correctly because I confirmed it with him before. Kem is a longtime member of the Zojo development community. I believe he was actually recognized at the last conference as having used Zojo since its original incarnation. Uh, so that's, you know, like really, really long time. Which was a surprise to me, by the way. He, he, he didn't know that he'd been using it that long. He, he was tripped. <laughs> but I'm going to let uh, Cam give a little bit of an overview about how he came to start using Zojo and what he used it for. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, my primary business was uh, has been consulting, Macintosh Consulting. I've been doing that since 1992. And I remember I was at a client one day, and he had asked me a, a question. Um, and then I thought, well, I could, uh, you know, I don't think there's anything on the market to meet his need. But uh, perhaps I can develop something. And I stopped. And I thought, I don't have anything to develop in anymore. Uh, I used to have tools. I used to use a tool called uh, Prograph on, in, uh, back in the uh, System 7 days and the System 9 days. Uh, that had been discontinued, and uh, the direction my business had, had moved. I was using FileMaker, and I was using 4D for database development, but I didn't have anything that I could write a standalone program in, and I thought, well, that's a problem. So I went to the market to look around uh, for what was available. And this must have been around 1998, right? Because that's when... Uh, yeah, the real- first version was, in, was released in 1998, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I looked around and I found Future Basic. Uh, I don't know if you remember that version. I, I remember hearing of it. I've never seen it in action. Future Basic was nice. It was a basic dialect. It was a... Um, what you might call a traditional type of environment where you created text files of code and you had to use includes to, to get all the pieces working together and they gave you a framework to give you a template of how to, of how to do it. And there was a separate application to edit the, the, uh, the GUI. Uh, and it was fast, it was very fast. So I used that for a while, and, but I, I wasn't completely satisfied with the experience, as you might imagine. So I, I kept looking and I came upon... Real Basic, and I saw the uh, I saw the the editor for it, and I said, you know, this is kind of nice. Everything is all included. You can throw a button on a screen. You can put the code right in the uh, right in the button. It, it reminded me a bit of how HyperCard works without HyperCard's limitations, because it was a true programming language. And I slowly started switching to. I found myself using Real Basic uh, more and more, even though in side-by-side speed comparisons, it wasn't as fast as Future Basic. The 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 difference was eh, was actually minimal for for most uh, for most functions, and the experience was so much better. So I I adopted Real Basic. Now I I I was told at XDC that that was version 1.0. I thought I came in at version 2.0 or 3.0, but I guess the records don't lie. Uh, it was 1.0. Uh, I don't so, the records possibly, can't possibly lie. I came in at 3.5, I think, and that would have been like 2001. Something like that, yeah. I, I know that it was a, I think I remember it was a long time between version 1 and 2, and then 2 and 3, and then the versions started coming quicker. Um, I don't know when, when Jeff took over, but I, I think it had some correlation to when Jeff took over. Uh, but I don't know. Who, who remembers that far back? Yeah, it's ancient history. You know? Exactly. So uh, I, I had started adopting Real Basic, and I started using it more and more, at first to um, to do simple tools for myself and tools for my clients, and it's it's been like that ever since. Wow. So you've been consulting since the early 90s. Yeah, yes, but uh, I actually, last February, I informed my clients that I'm no longer doing uh, day-to-day consulting. Uh, it, got to be, it got to be a little too much. I, I, there, was, there are development projects that I want to work on that I just wasn't finding time to work on. The thing about consulting is you don't, because you're, um, you're, you're maintaining networks for people, you're maintaining their systems, emergencies are coming up all the time, questions are coming up all the time. You, don't, you can't plan a day. You can get up in the morning and say, okay, I've got nothing on my schedule, I can work on this project, that project, and by the end of the day, 
you haven't worked on anything except taking phone calls and answering emails from clients. And uh, I decided that I was going to make a change and move away from that aspect of my business and move, uh, move towards full-time development. And when you say that you were doing consulting, it was primarily, it sounds like, IT-type consulting. Yes, IT consulting. And uh, I'd say it's about uh, 70% IT-type consulting and about 30% development. Okay. For, uh, for, for, for clients. Uh, that was mostly uh, in... Uh, actually, that was mostly in... Well, it used to be in 4D and, and FileMaker and then changed mostly to FileMaker and then also you know standalone applications as needed. All right, neat. Yeah, I... Uh... I haven't done a lot of IT type work. You know, you always get roped into it as a developer at, you know, various companies because, you know, you're the person that knows how to use a computer. But uh, Right, you're the go-to guy that they that they ask. Yeah, but I, I've never had that as my official uh, job. It always did seem like it would be a little rough because, you, like you said, you never know what you're going to be doing. It, it always depends on, you know, what people's emergencies are. Yeah. Now, I can tell you that there were aspects of that that were very satisfying. You, you know, um, I don't know if I ever told you I'm a I'm a – a lawyer by training. I yes. practiced law for about two years and the consulting was supposed to be how I made ends meet until my law practice took off. Consulting took off instead. And I said, you know, I, I, I like this so much better. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go with this, but it gave me a, a, a an interesting comparison. I, I discovered I, I'm now I'm the same person, whether I go see you as a lawyer or I go see you as a consultant, I'm the same guy. I'm going to, I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I'm going to tell you what I think. I'm going to do research where I need to do research. And I'm going to give you the, uh, the best answers I know how to give and the most honest answers I can give. What I discovered as a lawyer is, one, nobody's ever happy to see a lawyer. Nobody comes in smiling. Nobody leaves smiling. The, the other thing I learned is nobody ever trusts a lawyer. As I said, I'm the same guy, but I had, I had clients who did not trust what I told them until the day I handed them the check, and it was exactly the amount I said it was going to be because they had to look. Right. As a consultant, you walk in, people are in trouble. You, you, you perform your magic. They're, they're happy to see you. They're glad you came. They, you, leave them, uh, you leave them with a smile. It's a very, it's a very satisfying vocation. Yeah, I had a, a slightly similar thing. Uh, years ago, the company I was working for, I ended up leaving to go do uh, consulting. So I, I was working with .NET stuff, and I was switching. I was going to do, you know, at the time, real basic consulting, I guess it was full-time. Mm -hmm. and, but I still did consulting with this company for another six months or so. Um, and I, I distinctly remember just all the stuff I presented while I worked there that didn't stick when I was a quote consultant and went in and presented it, they were all best ideas ever and were immediately implemented. <laughs> and I was exactly the same guy. I didn't work there. Yes. And it was just a very strange thing. It was very apparent and I, I could, I didn't understand it, but. I, I had an effect of some, some clients, not often, but some clients where I was, who are, you know, a, a lot of my clients were long-term clients. I, I had, I had clients and, uh, and I still do actually to, to some extent because they still call me, um, back in the, you know, from back in the early nineties. But some of the, uh, some of the clients that I had that I had for a while, I noticed an effect where I would tell them something and they would question it. You know, they didn't use to question it when I first came to see them. I would tell them to do X or I recommend Y and they would do X or do Y and, or they would, they wouldn't, but you know, they would strongly consider it. And then they got to a point where I tell them something, Oh, that's not really an issue. And I started saying, listen, you're paying me a lot of money for this advice, but if you want to disregard it, it's up to you. <laughs> and after, after I said that, usually then they would take a second look at what, uh, what I was saying. And, and naturally I was always right. Well, naturally. It, yes, of course. Yeah. All of us developers are always, always right. It's, it's a weird dynamic. And, and never introduce bugs. <laughs> and if there's a problem in the code, it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> <laughs> you have that in a little poster in your office, right? <laughs> yes. Must, it must be a Zojo bug. <laughs> Burn. Well, speaking of projects you've been working on, uh, something you recently posted to the uh, 
the Zojo Forum was, is a project called Kaju, which Kaju. That's right. I, I mean, before we dive into that, I, I, I think we should bring up for the listeners, we want to know why, you know, everything about you is so hard to pronounce. Huh? <laughs> well, you know, if it were easy, you wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to hold your attention. <laughs> Uh, you're, 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 you're talking, of course, of my last name, and in some instances, my first name, which, which seemed to confuse some people. Uh, my last name is pronounced Tekanai. It's a Turkish name, and uh, A-Y is pronounced I in, uh, in, uh, in Turkish. And I've Americanized a little bit by stressing the I a little bit, so it's Tekanai. And it's like take an I is how I tell people to do it. Uh, the, what actually throws a lot of people is chem because they don't want to hear chem. They don't want to write chem. They think it's a typo. They think they misheard. They right. think it's Ken, usually. They think it's sometimes Kim. Uh, I had an interesting effect when I'd go see people in uh, doorman buildings. And I'd tell the doorman, you know, they'd say, well, may I ask you know, your name? I'd say, it's, it's Kem. And I've always stressed the M, Kem. Ken? No, Kem. Cameron? No, Kem. Kim? No, listen to what I'm saying. It's Kem. <laughs> Anyway, but if uh, but at least it gets the conversation started. <laughs> yes, I certainly believe it would. That's that's funny. They could have a whole podcast of just uh, strange pronunciation problems you've had to deal with. Yes. So your new project that you created is called Kaju, that's and right. it is a uh, open source free right. project for a self updater for Zojo apps. Why don't you yes. Talk a little bit about it. Okay. Well, it, it, it it's something I've been thinking about for a while. Um, but never had time to do. Uh, I looked around the market, and, and of course, self-updating is something that's very convenient in our day-to-day lives when we have applications that offer self-updates and, and, and do them, and it's painless. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a beautiful thing to behold. Uh, and I looked around, and I saw that for the Mac market, there was Sparkle, and I know that uh, Christian of uh, Monkey Bread uh, incorporated Sparkle into a plugin and also some Windows uh, utility. I think he, he packages in there so that he has a similar type of uh, feature for both Mac and Windows applications. Although, I have, I, to be fair, I've never looked at Sparkle directly and I've never looked at the other, uh, the other uh, solution that he provides. But I didn't see anything for Linux, and I didn't see anything that worked the same way on all three platforms. But as I said, I didn't have time to do this. Well, I've been doing work with uh, Jeremy Calger at his, uh, at his company, Advanced Pricing. And in the project we're working on, the question of self-updating came up. And we threw back and forth the, the you know, should we, should we go with a uh, with the plugin like one Christian uh, offers, or should we develop our own? And because we are, uh, we we like in-house solutions. Right. Uh, we decided, you know, well, let's let's uh, develop our own. How long could it take? So the idea was, uh, rather than using some kind of external utility that you have to incorporate into your project that will handle the updating, which I think is how Sparkle uh, handles it, although I'm not sure. I did some experimentation with Zojo and discovered that you can make a shell script survive a quit on on all three platforms. Of course, Mac Mac and Linux are both Unix based, so the um, the Unix command no hop takes care of it. And on Windows, uh, apparently all shell programs survive the quit, so I didn't have to do anything special for that. Uh, the only thing about Windows is it opens the terminal window when it's running, but uh, I, I, based on my own experience and other people I've talked to, that's a normal experience for Windows users, so that wasn't a problem. So uh, we decided to go ahead using shell scripts to handle the updating. Uh, that's, how, that's how it came about, and um, because, because I'm doing this work for advanced pricing and they, you know, they, they, they needed it done, they basically underwrote the time that took to, to do this. So a lot of the thanks goes to them uh, for, for allowing me to do this. But I can tell you that it took far longer than I would have ever imagined. Just doing the Windows script took longer, I think, than every other part of the project. 
Now, it, it certainly took longer than the other two scripts combined because, you know, once you have the Mac script, the, Unix, the Linux script is not too different from the Mac script. Right. But then the Windows script, you have to use the batch, you know, the batch scripting uh, language, which is, I don't think it's been updated since, you know, 1908. And uh, it, it is just, it, it is very, very picky. And well, anyway, I'm sure anyone who's used Windows and batch files know, knows the issues or the kinds of issues I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, well, there is a more advanced scripting system, I think PowerShell or something like that, but I don't know that that's installed on windows automatically or if that's just a developer tool or something like that. well one of the one of the criteria we had is that it, it had to be able to use tools that were native to the system so uh thanks to help on the forum we, i was able to do the um uh the unzip natively on windows uh doing it on uh, mac and linux of course you use on mac you use uh, a ditto on the command line and on linux you use unzip which are both native tools. On Windows, we're using in uh, the, uh, using Olay, so that goes through the uh, through the OS. So it had to be native tools. Uh, the, the 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 point was that the end user did not have to install anything more on their system, and the developer didn't have to put anything more into their project than just right. these classes. And I'm happy to say that it it meets all those criteria. Uh, the only thing it doesn't do, which I'd like to introduce at some point, is it doesn't elevate. Uh, permissions, so the end user has to have right permission to the directories that are being affected. Yeah, that makes that's sense. how that's how it came about. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, certainly when you posted that on the forum, it had a large amount of discussion for for an add-on. So certainly, a well, I, I, was like. I hope people use it. I've, I've been introducing it in my, in uh, my own projects. The first, the one that I'm working on with uh, Jeremy, and then another another client whose project I'm maintaining. Uh, I've put it in. It's been, uh, you know, so I'm not only the, the, the developer of this, I'm actually a user. And uh, it's, <laughs> so far, it's, it's, it's met all the needs that I set out for, uh, that I set, for, set, set out to accomplish. And um, I've been, I'm actually quite proud of it. I'm very happy with it, the way it turned out. Well, it certainly is a nice looking tool and should be useful to a lot of people. I, in general, I've been very impressed lately with the amount of, uh, open source projects that have been appearing uh, for Zojo lately. I mean, I, I add them when I, when they're made, uh, when I see them or when someone brings them to my attention to the list uh, on our doc pages of these things. And the open source project list is getting pretty long, long enough. I may have to start thinking about categorizing it or something. Well, everyone listening to this should be aware because they may not be that if they have an open source project or actually any, any tool that they introduce for, uh, Zosho, they should let you know because you add it to the uh, special page in the documentation that lists these things. And that's a great resource for people who are looking for uh, for add-ons and other tools to, uh, to use in their development. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it doesn't even have to be one that you necessarily uh, created yourself. If you just come across one that uh, you notice, you know, we're not referencing in the docs or somewhere to make it easy for people to find. Yeah, by all means, let me know so I can get that added. Yeah, it's been a, a lot of busy people creating a lot of useful stuff that's been popping up. And particularly a lot of this, the later stuff I've been seeing is a lot of uh, iOS type things, which is... Well, which, which makes sense. Of course, yeah. yeah. I, th I think that's a, that's a great thing. I, I mean, it, it helps grow the community. It, it fills holes. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. And I think it's nice that people are out, out there uh, contributing their time to make, the, 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 to make the, the, the whole platform more robust. And I like that it helps expose people to uh, source control to some extent because most of these projects are hosted on GitHub, uh, which is a free repository. So it gives people a little tiny bit of exposure to Git, if, and if they're so inclined, they can uh, dig into it a little more. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. All right. Well, and speaking of forum-related things, uh, if anyone has perused the forum at any time since its inception when Zojo was released in a little while ago, a year or so ago. The, uh, anytime there's a post there that has the term regex or regular <laughs> within about, based on my timings and stat studies and averages, it's about 26 seconds. Tim <laughs> will be able to, is somehow posting a reply that exactly answers the question uh, that was asked. And first I'm wondering how he knows this because it's almost like it's, he senses it, a, a disturbance in the force, uh, but uh, 
And then, and secondly, I continue, even though I've, you know, had much assistance from Kim personally helping me with questions, I continue to look at regex and see hieroglyphics. <laughs> well, Paul, I have to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it's the other Kim. Right, right, right. It's that other, that's all those other Kims. Uh, I don't, I don't, well, I, I think the, uh, the prerequisite here is to, to not have a, a life per se and to be on the forums a lot. So it's not that I'm, seeing the regular expression posts more often than others. It's just that I, I, I try to keep up with the forum. So I check the forum uh, unless I get very busy in a day. I check the forum f- uh, fairly frequently. And uh, because I do that, the posts with regular expressions or those type of questions tend to pop out at me. Now, I wish there was a feature in the forum where you could set your own filters that, uh, you know, sort of like... Um, uh, Google's feature. What's the, what's Google's feature where you can uh, tell them that uh, there's a certain search that you want them to continue, continuously perform and inform you of? Yeah, yeah, I have some of those set up. I forget what they're called, though. <clears throat> I think everyone listening knows what we're talking about. So I wish there was something in the forum along those lines that I could put in certain terms like regular expression or regex or you know, other things, and it would actually flag those for me. Until then, uh, I just I'm aware of the new posts, and so I I I tend to spot the ones that uh, that are, interest me. Um, as for uh, as for your implied question of how I how I got so good at regular expressions, um, I, I think anyone who can get really fluent in regular expressions if they just write a regular expression editor. Like Reg X R X, like you did, right? Like exactly. I did. Um, <laughs> uh, although, as a uh, competitor, I advise you against doing that. It's too much. Not, work. That's not a good idea. <laughs> um, but uh, I, there's a great uh, there's a great website, regular hyphen expression dot info or regular hyphen expressions dot info. I think it's regular expression dot info, and it's a tutorial on regular expressions. And uh, I, a lot of what I learned, I learned from there, along with some other sources, and uh, just trial and error. Um, when I was uh, when I was actually writing uh, the app, to I, I would go into Zojo and I'd create test projects and and use the regex object to test my patterns to make sure that the matches it was coming up with was matching what regex rx was telling me. And if it didn't, then I would go back to regex rx and find out what was what was wrong. Through that, through that method, I actually discovered that there was, uh, in the past, I don't think they exist anymore, but there were bugs in the, in the way, the, um, I think, uh, uh, Zosia was handling replaces. And that's been since fixed. But um, just through trial and error, uh, obviously the point of an app like RegXRX is that you can do your trial and error in one place without having to write code and then copy that code into your project without, uh, you know, without too much trouble. Right. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I certainly, I, when I see the stuff you put together, like, man, that just, if you could whip those out, the lines of code you can eliminate is tremendous. It's an interesting thing about regular expressions is when you get to look at them, they, they, they are a programming language. So you can have subroutines, you can have straight inline code. Um, and, and if you get to, if you, if you put in a certain uh, uh, a mode, you can put spaces in, so you can space out the patterns to make them easier to read. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a language like any other language, and you can learn it like a language. Well, there you go. And uh, I think I, I I may have heard, or maybe I dozed off. Ken was offering free training to anyone that needs to. Yeah, I think you dozed off there. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> All right. Well, the last thing I have here on my list that you might want to talk about is that. Uh, if you've ever been to XTC, you may have seen Kim and I in a corner arguing about stuff. And uh, and what we're usually arguing about... D- discussing, Paul. Discussing. Discuss, yeah, discussing, right? Is that what we're usually discussing is uh, Red Sox versus Yankees and baseball stuff. And and uh, as Kim notes, a fair amount of the docs tend to use uh, baseball teams and stuff as uh, example information. That is incorrect. They tend to use Red Sox <laughs> as example information. <laughs> no, no, that can't be true. I, I have other teams in there. Uh, I did a search in the docs for the for a single mention of Jeter. Not even Derek Jeter, just Jeter. 
Not a single mention. It's amazing to me. Well, he doesn't play baseball anymore, so he's yes. And of course, the docs just came into to existence yesterday. So, and and, and that's a hard one to spell. So I, I try to stay away from it, and, and a hard one to pronounce too. <laughs> so, as, as you might guess, Kem and I are, are big uh, baseball guys, and maybe when the baseball season starts back up again, and we uh, and we uh, you know see the the Red Sox jump into an early lead, we'll have a, a podcast. <laughs> That would be us arguing about baseball with maybe a little bit of technical talk. I don't know if you want to wait that long, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was telling Kim before is that I every year I do a fantasy baseball uh, league that I've been running. I've been running it on Yahoo's fantasy baseball for a really long time. Uh, I'm going to guess like at least ten years, maybe fifteen. And if I may throw in here, every year he tries to talk me into. Uh, joining fantasy baseball also. Yeah, well, every year I tend to need someone. Is I bring in new people, and then they last a year or maybe two, and then they like drop out, and then I need to find new people. And so, yeah, I, I get pe- anyone that knows anything about baseball, I try to hit up to see if they're interested. And uh, so I've been doing that one for many years, but uh, the last couple of years, I have a neighbor that does a serious fantasy baseball league. Uh, they've been doing it for something like since the '80s where you had to do it by hand with paper and you'd get mailed to you the stats each week that you would then go through to calculate, you know, the positions of the, each person's teams and stuff. It's insane. I, I can't even imagine, but this, this group of 12 people have been doing it for that long. And apparently, and I've been helping them each year when they did the drafts and stuff, we'd go to actually our local uh, baseball stadium here where the, the Reds, one of the Red Sox minor league teams plays. And we'd have a, draft meeting in one of the conference rooms there. And I think uh, one of the people that works for the the Sea Dogs, as it is, is on on this league. And I would help out with the draft and stuff. Well, it turns out, and I was like, how do I get on this league? But it was like, you know, a Supreme Court justice, death or retirement. <laughs> well, luckily, there was a spot open and it wasn't a death. Someone retired from the league and said, you know, they, they'd had enough doing it this long. And they offered the spot to me. So I'm now in this league with a bunch of people that have been playing together for a really long time and me who barely understands all the crazy rules they have. So I'm like sweating bricks to get going. So I don't completely embarrass myself and come in last place this year. Well, I can tell you based on the moves that both teams have made, that the Red Sox haven't made any dramatic moves, I think. And the Yankees have been bringing in pieces. No, no, no superstars, just pieces. So they'll improve. I think defensively they'll improve. I mean, just the fact, I mean, I'm not, hardcore Yankee fans will hate that I'm saying this, but just the fact that Derek Jeter is reti- has retired will improve them at shortstop. And this is not a diss on Jeter as a player, just that he's not, he didn't retire as the player he had been in years He past. was not a young man for a shortstop. Yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, his range had suffered, and his defense had suffered, and his offense had suffered. And but uh, you know he's a he's a legend and a hero to many, so I had no problem with him being there. Having said that, uh, a new player at that position will, will, will be an improvement. Um, Except that that new player apparently is Stephen Drew. Uh, potential no, Stephen Drew will be playing second base apparently. Oh, that's right. They're going to shift yes. the position. Okay. Yeah. So they're they're platooning uh, Gregorius and. I don't remember the other player, but I don't think they've settled on a shortstop uh, uh, yet. Gregorius, of course, his uh, his offense is questionable, so uh, we'll see how that turns out. Then, of course, who knows where A Rod's going to play? They already they have a third baseman, so A Rod's probably going to be the DH. Whether he can hit anymore or not is anyone's guess. Yeah, he hasn't played in like a year and a half at this yeah, point because yeah, because of the suspension, and um, so I, I think defensively they'll improve. I think their pitching is uh, will be adequate. Um, I, I, I will remain to see the, the problem last year was really that they couldn't hit. I don't see anything this year that suggests that they will. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll have to see. The, the Red Sox had uh, multiple problems last year, as you might recall. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 I tend to forget. Where did they finish last year? Well, I, I, I seem to recall it throughout the year they were the reigning world champions, but... <laughs> That's uh, that. That meant a lot when they finished uh, at least behind everybody. I think. Uh, maybe. I, I mean, in the I mean, in the league. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe not that bad. Uh, but um, I, I'm not sure. That, uh, it's going to be interesting to see whether they can overcome the problems they had last year. Mostly because I don't know why they had their problems last year. Yeah, it seemed like it was a karma thing. Just in 2013, 
everything went right for them to get to and then win the World Series. And then everything. 2014, everything went wrong. And, uh, and it was just, you know, instead of having two relatively average years, they had one brilliant year. And then one absolutely horrific year. Well, let's not forget 2012, where they also had a horrific. Yeah, well, then that goes with my prediction. You know, if they last place 2012, first place World Champions 2013, and then last place 2014, we're now back in the, you know the next year. So it's obvious this is the year of the World Champion Boston Red Sox. You know, it's funny that's not as obvious to me. <laughs> <laughs> you can't argue with patterns. I say, well, let's not forget 2011. <laughs> Where specifically the September of 2011. Anyway, I, I, the, the point is that uh, the, the Red Sox, as a as a question, is whether they are a bad team that had a fantastic year in 2013, or whether they're a great year that just had a disastrous year in 2000. Uh, yeah, well, and I think you can say that about all the the teams, at least in the the Red Sox Yankees division, is they all seem to be. Uh, None are super great, and none seem to be really super awful, at least on paper. Well, the, the 2013 Red Sox were really super great. As you said, a lot of them, a lot of things really went right for them. I mean, it looked like every ball that was hit just found a, ho- a hole, and a lot of things really did go right for them. I can't say, as a Yankees fan, I can't say that we've had a great Yankees team for a while. So uh, it remains to be seen what, what, what this year brings. Yep. Well, it should be exciting. Is it? A, I'm not a football guy, but apparently there's some big football game coming up in a week or so. I've heard something about that. Yeah. But football is where you where you where you have a uh, a ball that you underinflate and you, yeah. you try to you well, throw, I, throw into a basket. I think. I'm in New. <laughs> I, I live in New England, and apparently these Patriot football team are going to the Super Bowl. But there's this big drama covering our newspapers about the footballs being deflated by something. I don't. I don't. Yeah, we've 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 heard uh, one or two things about that in New York. Yeah, too. So it's, it's just been pretty funny because I just laugh because every year I'm like I, I eagerly await the Patriots to lose in the playoffs so that finally people here will stop talking about football and. Now- <laughs> They made the the Super Bowl, so now and then you get this scandal on top of that, and it's just like never ending. But uh, for the uh, for any Jets fans who might be listening, the the uh, uh, Super Bowl is the game, the big game at the end of the season where the the teams that run the most uh, compete to to win the championship. Yeah, they may not they may not be familiar. <laughs> Slam. <laughs> I actually heard that joke on a on a show the, the other day. I thought it was very funny. Yeah, that is a bit funny. <laughs> yeah, so as a you know, Super Bowl. I I don't think I've ever really watched a Super Bowl to say I've watched it. You know, it'll be on the TV, and then I do the usual look up during the commercials to see the commercials, and then go back to reading or whatever I was doing when the actual game is on. Yeah, I'll I'll on that on that day of the Super Bowl, I will usually uh, check the score every now and then just so that I I, I at least know who won. Yeah, you kind of, you know, you got to know that. And you don't want to say, you know, like, who won the Super Bowl? And you come back and say something like, did the Knicks win? <laughs> <laughs> I think Tiger Woods won the Super Bowl. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you, you just look crazy. So. Yeah. Um, the, the, my theory of football, though, is it's a bunch of guys line up, crash into each other, fall down, get up and do it again. That's what football looks like to me. Well, yeah, I, I don't understand it at all. I, I was at my sister's last week. We had a, a big party for the whole family, and the Patriots are on. It was, I guess it was a couple weeks ago. But anyway, the, the Patriots are on, and everyone was watching it, and I don't understand it. I think she had me, like, fixing her Wi-Fi or something. And uh-huh. and there was there was some play about something where they were calling the penalty about something, and, and apparently it was because the, the player had touched the other player wrongly. And I'm like isn't this football? Isn't that like the purpose? Oh, well, you, you can't <laughs> touch them in certain situations and not if they're doing this or that. And I'm like, right, enough. I don't want to know anymore, but I, I'm sure it's a, a fun game and it, it seems like it works well for television. So that's probably why it's so popular. This has been sports talk with Paul Lefevre. We'll yes, be right back. Exactly. And this is, and this is the extent of it. I know nothing else about any sports. Uh, I really actually, and as you can obviously tell, I know absolutely nothing about football as we call it here in the United States. Uh-huh. Uh, apparently all my, uh, all our European listeners will then be contacting us and saying, that's not football. Yes. We're talking about the, 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 um, crappy American sport, not the crappy European sport. <laughs> I did not say that for the record. <laughs>
Uh, but yeah, I know nothing about any other sport. So I, I can only predict that at some point in the, the heat of summer, Kim and I will get back together and discuss baseball, but that's, uh, that's about it. By the way, in some regions of the world, what I just said could probably get me at least beaten up, if not worse. Yeah. 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 People will now find you and yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, in, in, insult the prophet Muhammad. That's one thing, but insult soccer. <laughs> now, now you're in verified territory. <laughs> There you go. Well, on that note, I think that's probably about enough for another episode of Zojo Talk. Since I'm going to be trying to do these a little more frequently, they probably don't need to be quite as lengthy. Not everyone has infinite time like uh, Cam over here. So, yeah. Nothing but time. <laughs> so I want to thank you, Cam, uh, for uh, being a part of Zojo Talk. And thank everyone for listening. Have a great day. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.